welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm Jess. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss <laughs> Battle Truck, which came out in 1982 from director Harley Cochlis. I should say this film also has an alternate title, Warlords of the 21st Century. Pretty badass. <laughs> now, there was a whole series of films all influenced and inspired by one key movie. Mad Max, which released in 1979. And since then, we have had Metal Storm, the destruction of Jared Sin, World Gone Wild, A Man Called Rage, Wheels of Fire, Striker, 2020 Texas Gladiators, She-Wolves of the Wasteland, and many Many, many more. Yeah. <laughs> this is a genre that I quite like to dabble in. It's kind of in that exploitation grindhouse feel. Because you can make these movies on the cheap. And yes. all you need to do is have some titillation, some chase sequences, and some crazy maniacs dressed in studded leather. <laughs> and a reasonably good mechanic to build some wacky looking cars. Hell yeah. It's wacky racist for adults. <laughs> well, the synopsis for this one... <laughs> the story follows Hunter, played by Michael Beck of the Warriors fame, who rescues Corley, a young woman from a ruthless gang in a post-World War III apocalyptic setting. I like this place. We could stay here for a long time. Yeah, it's it's got a cast of people you probably don't know. Um, a couple of people stand out and have had careers since, but all in all, it's it's not the best acted film we've ever seen. No, Hunter is a bit wooden. Would be the gentle opening. He 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 doesn't appear initially. It starts at the very beginning where you have the criminal gang sort of uh, rampaging with their renegade colonel because it's uh, and you hear a little bit of exposition at the very start over the kind of newscast radio. Yeah, there's like an. Oil fire, I'm guessing. Um, yeah, and, and it sort of silhouettes the kind of opening of the film. Yeah, and the radio broadcast just says, yeah, the World War Three broke out and everybody's dead. And there's one renegade colonel rampaging through the countryside while the army try to protect the cities. Um, and that's confusing and weird sounding. But at least it sets up sort of who the main character, well, the main villain of the piece is. Yeah. Because, yeah, as you said, Michael Beck is not, not the best actor. I've, I mean, this is the I think this is the first time I've seen him in anything outside of The Warriors. And in The Warriors, he's fantastic because it's a fantastic film. And, yeah, in this, he doesn't turn up until, like, 15 minutes in. And then he disappears out of the film again for, like, another 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I get it. I mean, that's playing on the more modern trope, which you've got the main character like in Mad Max Fury Road where you kind of don't have Max as the main character in his own film it's more about Furiosa in this it's sort of subverting your expectations but doing that a little bit but it's not really achieving it because it just doesn't really know what it's doing um, the script's loose and wobbly there was a writer's strike around this time that might have affected the early production of this film um, well I mean I, I don't know if the writer's strike really affected this film at all the writer's strike of 1981 mainly affected television series well, it feels um, like a television series. Uh... Uh, well, Roger Corman <laughs> was the one who helped get this film greenlit. Um, the director went to him and just said, yeah, I'm working on this idea. And Roger Corman was just like, oh, that's great. I can already imagine the poster now of this battle truck. <laughs> um, so I'll give you half the money towards the film. And then literally days before they started production, um, Roger Corman turned around and went, yeah, I'm going to give you uh, a third of what I said. Not half. <laughs> and so they kind of lost some of that production money, still went ahead with the shoot anyway. And uh, and Roger Corman's only other input after that was at, was at a screening later on. And he told the director, remove that line and remove that line from the film because you're getting inappropriate audience responses to what your characters are saying. Other than that, that it's it's all, you know, Michael Coakless is, is, is work. Yeah, well, it's good. I mean, it's... An early 80s kind of B-movie. It's not memorable in many cases, but the actors, as we said, sort of get through it. There's some good... There's some all right ones. Like, um, you've got Corley, who's the kind of main centre of the story, I'd say. It really is, in some ways, more about her, because you follow her through almost the whole story. Um, she's kind of trapped in the camp with her 
father-like figure. You're never quite sure the relationship. It's no. got some darker undertones to it, maybe, but you're not really sure. I and got the impression that she was a a rape victim. Maybe. Because and it's the post-apocalyptic future. It's lawless society, and she's the only female in their entire group. And when... Other characters look at Corley, they, they look at her hands and they go, oh, there's no calluses, like, what sort of work do you do? Yeah, and it's for, either it's clever, trying to be clever and right around it, or in many ways she's the colonel's sort of daughter. And which... so she's protected from all kinds of work. Yeah, cause he, and, and you kind of open in a very heavy-handed moment because you can tell that she's unhappy with her life because she drags to him to shoot a man. And... And of course she refuses, she's nothing like him. She's, no. Yeah. And you're not sure, again, it's whether or not it's a daughter being rebellious or a prisoner being rebellious. It's just um, a bit ambiguous, but it's also too heavy-handed because you don't get any setup of... He does seem to later on in the movie show some interest in her security and safety. Well, his entire drive throughout the entire film is to retrieve her, to get her back. Yeah. It's like he's he's sacrificing countless amounts of resources to get back this one woman. So you get the impression maybe it is more important to him. And none of the other... His crew don't seem to be so desperate to recover her. They're just rampaging, pillaging, mercenary band, as it were. So exactly, So I do yeah. kind of get the impression there's more there that either is either lost in edits, cuts, directorial uh, writing, who knows. It just seems... One of the many problems this film kind of has is not quite bringing it all together, because there's some good elements, but it just doesn't come together at the end of the day. No. Well, she is an interesting actress yes. though, and uh, I only ever seen her in one other film besides this one. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. <laughs> oh, oh. And and that's cool. I mean, at least she had so she. I think she had some other no, um, not notable, but she she just. She continued to work. She continued to work. There's many actors in this film who continue to work. That's about the best you can say for it. Other characters that crop up through the film, uh, James Wainwright as Straker um, is the main villain of the piece, and his career wasn't particularly notable either. Um, a lot of television stuff. A lot of television, and a lot of it's regional locked, because there was a mixture of Australian, New Zealand, English, and American actors on this production, so it is quite an eclectic mix. Um... Well, it's, it's, it's mainly an American production, although it was obviously filmed in New Zealand with a New Zealand crew and a predominantly New Zealand cast. Yeah. Um, it, it is noticeable if you listen for it, you'll, you'll hear some of the expendable cast of the background have local accents, but then the more central actors have clearly been shipped in or yeah. sourced locally for various reasons. It's not something I have a big issue with in films, yeah. uh, with the accents and dialogue like that. I don't mind it in a sci-fi setting. I don't yeah. mind it when you can kind of quietly... Well, I mean, this is a sci-fi setting. Yeah, but it's, it's not. When you have an apocalyptic yeah. setting, you generally isolate populations. So but it is the if... future. Well, well <laughs> fair enough. But um, outside... It's more forgivable, I'd say, still. There was also John Rattenberger, Rusty. He's he's the most interesting person to come out of this. He had the most broad career afterwards, and actually, by certain metrics, is one of the most successful actors of all time. Um, he's purely by pure box office of the films he's been in since. He's appeared as a voice actor in almost all the recent Pixar films. Um, he's even done voice work on like Spirited Away, one of my favourite kind of Asian cinema films. He's also appeared in Superman Two and The Empire Strikes Back. So, he's been in a lot. That's just touching kind of the tip of the iceberg. The man's had a pretty extensive career. But a lot of the American audience and people from the UK who might have seen it at the time will recognise him from Cheers. Um, he was a full-time character on Cheers as Cliff Calvin. Um, it's interesting. He's probably one of the better actors in the movie. Um, I quite liked his kind of role as the mechanic. mechanic. Yeah, he was one of the more memorable characters. He was friendly, he was welcoming, he had a personality, he had some charisma, and you kind of cared for his character as well. And he had guilt. He was guilty because he, he gives away at a key point in the middle of the film the whereabouts of uh, Hunter, who yeah. obviously yeah. Uh, is a bit cross about it, but acts like a wooden plank when he shows up. So he, <laughs> he, but there's no empathy. You gave away my position. It's just like, uh, yeah, but you can see he's injured. It's just like... If you, if you switch it into a Mad Max comparison, Max shows compassion when... Yeah, he needs to, and there's humanity in Max, and this actor just can't portray that. No, <laughs> um, and most of the cast can't portray much. I mean, they're either young actors, and maybe that's the argument they're kind of getting into their turn. And a lot of these people went on to do full time careers. Um, well, my uh, my favorite actor, I think, in the film was the actor who played Bone, which is uh, John Back, and uh, he'd appeared in uh, 
the latest Spartacus TV series. Yes. Uh, he was also in The Lord of the Rings as well. He was Madril, who was Faramir's kind of best lieutenant. Yes. Uh, just because uh, I had, had a standout presence, even even in minor roles. Well, the funny thing with this, because everyone's from New- a lot of the cast from New Zealand, you've also got you've got a lesser character called Mark Hadlow, play- who plays Paul, um, and he actually plays Dory in the Hobbit trilogy. He- he's again, these people. Are- it's funny you're seeing all these people who are local to the New Zealand area, not necessarily New Zealanders. This is the bit that gets a bit confusing. Some of them are people who have moved to New Zealand to make films because New Zealand's a hot spot for making these sorts of budgeted films because New Zealand has really good tax laws in regards to filmmaking over there so they encourage a lot of filmmaking and it's a beautiful country so you've got lots of to play with in that kind of wonderful playground of uh, it's just beautiful New Zealand so let's break down the story and see how it plays out Straker and his gang kidnap these two off the road which leads them to an oil reserve in a restricted contaminated zone sort of government facility or an abandoned one, yeah, or a uh, hidden one. It's a very sci-fi kind of control terminal that pops out the ground. Yeah, it was pretty cool looking. <laughs> it was cool looking, but it was jarring because the kind of production quality on that, <laughs> and technology to... on that was so advanced compared to anything. The truck, inside of the truck, I always just kept looking and going, this is the future? This doesn't look like the future. It was just a kind of just rust got some bucket. plated armor on it. Yeah, and, it's and an some old gun truck. <laughs> but yeah, that truck though, it still looks fantastic. Looks... The battle truck lives up to its name. Yeah, for its it, look, it, it's their set piece, centerpiece. They clearly invested most of the budget in that. Well, it broke the record for a time. I think it was like the most expensive uh, prop or oh, moving prop. Uh, in film history at the time, so. yeah, and they, and yeah, it, it, it's used to its end in this film, right? <laughs> and so once Straker has this camp, he kind of lays down a map and tells his troops how they're gonna facilitate this place and and keep it. And that's when Corley decides she's had enough of this and she finds time to escape. Of course, the gang realizes that she's escaped and try to chase after her. And this is when Hunter finally turns up. On his motorcycle, realizes that there's a woman in trouble and saves her. Manages to get away. He bandages up her wound, explains that he's not a people person, that she is, and so he takes her to Clearwater, which is a band of survivors helping each other through this post-apocalyptic world. Yeah, sort of democratic stronghold of free people. Yes, is, it's nice. It's sweet. It is weird again, and just to kind of go back, it's just the on their relationships how they kind of have to spell everything out. Where I think the best things about like Mad Max was you had great actors and writing kind of delivering these in Mad Max Two because Mad Max One is the setup so much. If you compare this more to Mad Max Two um, or Road Warrior, it depends what you want to call it. Um, <laughs> the nature of the kind of Max's character interacting with other characters and it expands into Mad Max Three to some extent as well, where he is unspoken. You can tell he's not social. He's a broken man who is introvert. You kind of want that for this character, you, but again, it's a carbon copy. The, the nature of this film is it's a homage or rip off, whichever word you want to use in this particular case, and they just don't deliver there. Again, this is the problem with this going through this plot. I could pick at these moments because all of it is a little bit wobbly. Because the point you get where he takes her to the town, you meet the new, the rest of the cast, people who you know like uh, the mechanic, Mm -hmm. Rusty and stuff. They're all good people, um, but you don't really get connected with people. Like, she stays with them, and then off off our main character goes again into the the wilderness to not be relevant for another few bits, and you carry on following following Coraline. Yeah, she's reading Cinderella to the kids. She's giving them her necklace. She's, you know, she's... Bec- making herself part of the family. Yeah, and she kind of is even asked out on a kind of date by one of the local I think that's lads. Dory who's asking her yes, out. Yes, yeah, Dory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but of he, course, one of the questions Rusty asks her when she gets in is like, are you single? Do you have a boyfriend? You know, because it's like, oh, there's a lot of bachelors here, so be careful. Don't open yourself up to too many invitations because you'll just upset somebody. Yeah, okay. and that's kind of... St- it's sweet and again it's the friendly sort of honesty of it I mean they're not there's no real foreshadowing of the kind of well there is because things. there is the character that when, when Rusty's speaking to her about it the guy that passes behind them with the beard yes 
You know, he he's the one. You know, like you just look at him going, "You're a wannabe villain." Straight off the yeah, bat. Yeah, that's the problem again with the writing. They foreshadow things a little heavy-handedly. Instead of making him out to be... A neutral kind a of neutral character. A neutral or even yeah. a good guy and then doing the switcheroo yeah. where he betrays the group, which... I mean, he's the one who's the, who doesn't vote for her straight away when they're voting whether they should let her into their community or not. Yeah, it should have. If he, he should have been ha- voting her in while somebody like Rusty maybe said no. Mm. It, it would have been smarter to switch that sort of vote where you think, oh, he's friendly towards her. Actually, no, he's an because he has another motive. Yeah, ul- yeah, he has an ulterior motive. Uh, but yeah. that's smart writing, which I don't think this film does very well. Um, it's you men, you men are misdirect with kind of character art plots, and you know, let's be honest. Let's go. The one thing you have to say about this is character arcs. They don't really exist. No, there aren't any in this film. <laughs> but everyone is who they are. From and so beginning to th- end. that's why you've got to hope then that at least the action or the set pieces or the explosions kind of make up for it. And it's not too long before the battle truck returns, smashes through the front gate of the community, guns blazing. A couple of the community members get shot and fall off buildings. You're like, okay, this is... This and we is, think this is they die, up. but they may not die. There's like, no the, blood. It's yeah, bloodless. The one, the one guy who asks out Coraline <laughs> he gets immediately shot. shot. But then he's kind of scampering away. On it's like, is he dead? Is he gonna die? Did he yeah. get shot? There's no blood. I can't tell. It is incredibly unhelpful in their action direction with that truck. Yeah, I mean they do some great stunt work with it later on. Yes, but it, it, here the truck just kind of pulls up, and Straker tells everyone, "Come out, put your guns down." He does that a couple of times. He and, just and drives that was, around yelling at people through. And that was the end of the speakers. action sequence. It was like, let's. Oh, like, he has another okay. dramatic exit from his truck, which yeah. he always like appears and in his kind of military camo. It's just like, yes, I am now going to order some of you around and begin gathering resources. Yay, looting! Says the crazy member of his yeah. criminal band. And so they go and grab the women and go and grab the guns. And again, I was like, I was partially expecting an exploitation film, but it's actually really clean. You know, there's no I, raping, I there's Holly- no blood. It is a Hollywood thing, though. I think, yeah. even though it is. It's not an Italian movie, but then again, it's not. It's not a grindhouse American movie. No, so I think the, that's probably the price for this film is going to pay because it's not truly filling a niche. It's sort of a Hollywood production, so fairly tame. It's trying to mimic a good kind of grander production in the form of Mad Max, the Mad Max series broadly, um, which is never a good idea to be too easily compared to another film. I think we've said this before in other film reviews. You don't want to be drawn to the classics. Right. Um, Max is an interesting protagonist in that he is the nameless man with no name. He's he's another version of Clint Eastwood's kind of... He's an avatar for the audience. Yeah. He, to, to to be in that world. Yeah. and uh, Well, it's the same as the man with no name. It's the mystery man. There is a mystique to having this kind of hist- almost forgotten hero. And especially in the Mad Max films as they evolve, especially by the third one, he's a mythical figure in in the universe, not just to us as the viewer. And it's the same with the uh, the Man with No Name the, and the Sergio Leone trilogy. You kind of end up with these characters that are kind of just mythical, and and that in a sense allows you to kind of get around the need for them to have an arc. But your trick then is to have secondary characters they adopt to sort of either. To flesh yeah. those characters out. You usually yeah. cast around them. And I think it's evolved more and more in the newer Mad Max films to give you that. Because I think that's an example of Furiosa. The idea that you've got Max as an engine for this storytelling. Now it'd be interesting to see if and when they do that sequel with Charlie Thrizz on um, Furiosa. If it can stand up. She's a great actress. Absolutely lovely actress. But again, it's taking the post-apocalyptic petroleum wars sort of idea burning you know um the lack of fuel but somehow that really matters and the world turns into a desert suddenly if it works i hope it does because I, I honestly want more of this genre but i think you definitely need a good hand to be able to steer it into something unique this film doesn't do that this film um and it plays it by the numbers and plays it very very safe it's a cool truck and there's explosions <laughs> for its time the pyrotechnics in this film were really good yeah um, well, so Straker and his team have, have now taken over Clearwater, but of course Corley has managed to escape via horseback, and she rides all the way back to Hunter. And then Hunter's like, okay, well I guess we're going to have to go on the run, because the truck turns up at Hunter's house and starts demolishing things, riding through everything. They love smashing the truck, like there's an early shot, really early back in the film, where he just drives through a 
a, an abandoned petrol station for no discernible, right at the beginning of the yeah, film. No yeah, no discernible reason. <laughs> it's just they're having fun driving a war this war truck through. It things. looks cool. Yeah, <laughs> it's like was one of the best things about the film was just watching that truck demolish stuff. Yeah, it just appeals to that. I don't know that destruction that you want him in a film it is like this. Cool. It is cool, but I will be honest. This film just struggles to keep me engaged the rest of the time. <laughs> yeah, there are... I mean, the film is only an hour and a half, but it feels like there is too much downtime. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll be honest. I watched this with some my finger ready to skip because I was just like, where's yeah. the next explosion? Because these character arcs don't exist. I'm not really motivated by anybody here. The mechanic maybe has the only interest... Again, being one of the most, more notable actors, um, Rusty is... Uh, maybe given more screen time for that reason. Yeah. But he just has more interesting emotion and heartbreak when he's portrayed Hunter. Uh, there's nobody else that gives me a, a give a, you give a damn about. Like when they're walking around the desert to keep it point where we are in the narrative. There's just no chemistry. No. She kind of has. There's meant to be, I think. Like she's clearly pining for the hero of the story. She's meant to be at least. Because that's the thing, but because he saved her life, and so she's grateful, and he's enigmatic and distant. Yeah, it's the hero but, archetype. Yeah, there is no chemistry between them whatsoever, and I was kind of thankful there was no gratuitous sex scene in this film because no. I didn't really want to see it. No, because they're so wooden, it would have seemed even more unnatural. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's just a bit sad, really. But I did like I did like some of the chase sequences. I liked the uh, the helicopter kind of drone shots flying over with the music playing. I was like, oh, these are cool sequences. Is they're fun, you know. I, I could see some of the inspiration in this film that that uh, Turbo Kid kind of borrowed from. And you got to keep in mind the motorcycle that because we well, didn't mention that Hunt has a sort of future sci-fi. It, it, it kind of has the same like armor plating as the truck. Yeah, as if it's military <laughs> standard in that age. Kind he's, of. He's yeah. former military. I think it's foreshadowed clearly. <laughs> yeah. And he, the colonel's obviously renegade. Military. But when he's riding around and and it's just like an eighties BMX video. <laughs> oh, I actually thought that too. <laughs> it does a jump. Yeah. It's like. Oh, this is this is something. I just want to slap some synth wave on it, and I'll probably enjoy it a little bit more. Yeah, in, in the end, he loses a girl, and it all kind of goes to hell. And... Well, there, there is there is another kind of cool chase sequence when uh, the uh, the gang's in a car chasing after them. Yeah, because the truck and... is a car friend. And there's a yes, truck in a yeah. car, and uh, she he's passing uh, these little silver dynamites things these devices and she keeps throwing them at the car and the car's swerving and missing um and then he passes her another one and he's like throw it at that tree and she does and then you watch the explosion go off beside where the device landed <laughs> and you can still see the device after the explosion as the tree's coming down it's just like, oh dear oh no <laughs> I, I don't know whether that's made me enjoy the film more or less uh, yeah, it, 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 sh- oh, um. just watching out for you know continuity errors and mistakes and you would have assumed the people with the pyrotechnics if they're going to do a set shot with throw something at the tree, blow the tree up, surely they would have timed it better. But hey, I guess that was just <laughs> too much for planning. Yeah, but it was it was an exciting chase sequence, and of course, yeah, they they get away. Yeah, and they get you know they get away, and then eventually the adventure continues. You get they go back. I thought I thought the film was then going to be one of those. Okay, so now Hunter comes back to Clearwater, teaches all of the locals how to defend themselves, so that when the big bad turns up, the local townspeople can defend their homes. But it's not really like that. No, he kind of draws them away for a trap. But he does use the local townspeople. Yeah. Because early in the film, he gives a rocket launcher to one of the townspeople, and that gets used shockingly later in the film. Um, and it's again, it's these. Just dumb writing. Um, it's too well, obvious. When you do things that are obvious, it becomes too obvious. Well, it's that it's that bearded character again, who who we mentioned earlier, who who captures Corley and then takes her back to Straker uh, for a reward of some kind. But he only gets beaten up for his troubles. <laughs> yeah, it, and it's you know because he got scratched by Corley, and the again this is where you think the father aspect kit comes into play because is he just got her almost as a trophy daughter or is it something more or is it you don't know the old man takes great dislike in the fact that she's been, had taken had any harm caused to her although he's stressing on the living crap out of her by chasing all over the countryside he's just unhinged completely <laughs> i know not the motives don't make sense but uh, 
you go with it. you go with it. Um, so at that point, the um, they have to rescue her, save the day. Yeah, and there is that <laughs> that sequence when Hunter's just like, "Oh, she's been taken. I'm gonna go and rescue her." And we have this prolonged sequence where he's riding after her on his motorcycle. Only then to get shot by an arrow. Oh, by by the crater. <laughs> and then he has to drive all the way back to Clearwater. To get medical attention. To get medical attention. They put his arm in a sling. And then two hours later, he's totally recovered. <laughs> to bring, bring the kick <laughs> and, then, and then he's chasing after them again. And I do love the shot where he's, uh, he's in the bike. And he goes up the ramp. And then lands the bike <laughs> in the truck. Like that was a cool stunt. It was a cool stunt, and it was one of the, but but only when the tops been blown off by the rocket launchers. Right, the key to the setup. Yeah. So it, it's kind of like setting up a joke for like an hour into a film. Um, <laughs> and, but it's a good. Ch- it, it is one of the cool kind of stunt scenes. Um, then there's a fight in the truck, which is choreographed terribly, but that's more like most. <laughs> It is a, it is of its time. But yeah, you get the fight through the truck then, and it's sort of dramatic. Yeah, yeah. We should mention the driver who loves his trucks being killed at this point. Bone, yeah. Bone, bone. Because Bone's <laughs> like you, you, you're burning out the truck. It's like you're it's overheating. overheating. <laughs> it's like it's overheating. What? Anyone, anyone who's basic understanding of cars is like, what's running this truck? What right. Futuristic tech. Well, it's di- it's got to be diesel. But I know diesel engines <laughs> overheat. I mean, if you haven't got a working carburetor, but it's the battle truck. It's the battle truck. <laughs> um, so he gets upset and he's killed by uh, the evil colonel. Um, and then the, the truck's swerving. I'm on the clear, and they're trying to drive it. And at that point, Hunt just grabs the girl and jumps out the truck. Well, no, he he smashes uh, Straker with the fire extinguisher. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> Straker with the fire, the out control truck. Straker's kind of concussed then, and tries to get control of the truck again, but they've jumped out. And it's all a bit confusing because it isn't logistically making a lot of sense because it is a really close quarters fight that isn't greatly choreographed. Right. How he quite jumps out the truck and all that is a bit unclear. But, and then it, the one big money shot of the film yes. comes up. And they pack an awful lot of pyrotechnics into the truck. Because <laughs> I guess it had a lot of diesel stores on board. Sure. Let's go with that. That's, it had to that's tra- why it would explode before it even hits the ground. Yeah. <laughs> now, apparently they used six cameras to ensure this. Because obviously it's the most expensive prop. Uh, it's and- the only take they're going to get of it. So, yeah, six cameras to make sure one of them gets it. And they blew and, it uh, the one camera, they use one camera. I mean, I, I don't see any edits here, but it is just the one camera that got the whole take uh, really, really well. I love the shot of it coming down towards the camera, yeah. it moving back, and then moving back in for the explosion. And then, of course, the big fireball. It's just like, yeah, that was Yeah, there were bits that bouncing off satisfying. them, small flames dancing off them. Yeah. It was lots of debris. Yeah, it looked, it looked great. It was the money shot of the film. I mean... I was sad to see it go. Yeah, it, it was. <laughs> there's no sequel. There's, there, that's the end of that truck. But yeah, they're, 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 that's essentially the end of the adventure. There is some closing awkwardness where he walks through people saying goodbye. Yeah. The most, that's just further hammers home how little you've got a connection with these people. <laughs> uh, and with him, it's not like Mad Max where there's almost, they're like, stay Max, stay. No, no, you can leave because all of us are wooden and none of us really have a connection. <laughs> yeah, yeah he, le- he leaves Corley at the camp and he just... Rides off into the sunset. A very Western moment. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> Credits again, it, rolling up. Yeah, it's just it's not the same as any Sergio Leone Western that rides no. off into the sunset. It's not the same as Max driving off into the sunset. It just has no meaning or depth. Um, but the truck exploded pretty, and that 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 would be the. Yeah, I mean oh. the film's over once the the truck is dead. Yeah, because <laughs> much like the film that happened before it and after it, none of it really matters. No. <laughs> So, Jess, do you have any memorable or favourite scenes from the film, or worst scenes from the film? I think, I think all the way back to the start, I said it, I said it at the very beginning, in that moment that Corleen's taken to shoot a person, she's dragged him. There's no subtlety in this film, and it, it, I knew from that moment 
what film I was watching. The lack of kind of script structure, directorial slash actor functionality, because there's no real... I mean, the main villain, uh, if you want a deadpan villain, he functions fine. Nobody else really... Coraline I like. I like her. She, she's fine. She does her role as the kind of moderately... <laughs> but I'm being nice. I mean, it's really... <laughs> I'm trying to think of actors besides Rusty that I liked in this film. But that opening just told me everything I needed to know. It was so heavy-handed. Instead of walking her up, like, she is a member of their community of this roving band. Even as a kind of... If it was more insidious in the way she interacts with them. Which I still don't think it was. It gets very confusing. You don't know. Because they never explore it even metaphorically. You I know it's, as we said, a studio film. But they never explore it. But the moment she refused to shoot him. You're like, oh, but if I had her refuse him. It looked like she was accepting of this. Until he asked her to kill someone. You're like, oh. So that's the straw that breaks the camel's back. Then she runs away. Yeah. Um, so then she's put up with it. She's coexisted with these people. Now she can't take it because she's not a murderer. So that's the, one, the the line she won't cross. You didn't get that. There was no subtlety in that moment. You're like, oh crap, it's all going to be like this. My favourite moment is the explosions. <laughs> yeah. Pyrotechnics. Just blow stuff up. It's the only thing you can say about it. Anytime there's some of the stunt work with the bike and the, the cars, even the opening where you've got the truck kind of driving after the hawk the car <laughs> horse drawn, pull, yeah. truck at the, the car at the very beginning I like all of the kind of prop work the prop works good yeah um, outside of vehicles it's not so good because like I said that one thing that pops up looks sci-fi nothing else looks sci-fi so I felt that in retrospect that's jarring in the sense that it was such a good prop well, nothing it else. It felt like good. it was from another film entirely. Yes, yeah, and the, yeah. the vehicles didn't feel that sci-fi. There was a kind of sci-fi viewer yeah. that you had a hunter look through now and then, but it wasn't really that. There wasn't enough to give you the idea it was sci-fi. Yeah, it, a lot of it just felt post-apocalyptic to this age, which is the Mad Max play. It tried to put it. The slant on it was sci-fi post-apocalyptic, which mm, didn't right. work because it didn't really deliver on the sci-fi side of it. Um, but yeah, the explosions. Explosions were pretty much awesome. The ending explosion. <laughs> Um, and the destruction of various vehicles through it were pretty fun. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I, I echo your sentiments almost exactly. Watching the truck at the beginning drive through that, that gas station, <laughs> watching the truck drive through the barn, watching the battle truck drive through the front gate, yes. watching the battle truck drive through uh, Clearwater, and then, unfortunately, watching the truck fly off a cliff. Rest in peace, little truck. Rest and of course, I'm never going to forget that silver device landing next to the tree and the explosion going off next to it instead of it exploding and knocking down the tree. If only they had CGI to cover up the mistakes. <laughs> yeah. There were lots of them. Um, uh, uh, there are so many terrible sequences in the film that you just... I just wish that they could have... It's mundane terrible as well. It is. It's, it's, it's not it's... hammy enough to make me laugh. The, the, the thing is, that I, the film isn't bad... But it's not good. It's no. it just kind of goes above and below average so much. So I'm just like, there are far worse films in this genre. Oh yes, but absolutely. then there are far better ones as well. But then again, if you get worse, it's all it's the thing about B movies is if you get bad enough, it becomes something. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's the nature of the room and stuff is so terrible. There's an, own, an enjoyment from that. You, you're just horrified by the the mayhem yeah. of the, the, the. How did this happen? How did yeah. somebody let this happen? <laughs> this film is like, uh, okay, just a lot of bad decisions. Yeah, some couple of good decisions. Had nice truck. Yeah, it blew up nicely. <laughs> Outside of that, I guess everyone got a paycheck, and you know that's good. People got paid, and some of them went on to do really cool stuff, which we said, which which was good for them. Um, well, Jez, would you recommend Battle Truck? Probably not. Um, it's 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 not a terrible film, but mundane isn't what I like to recommend. I mean, there's better. Just rewatch any of the Bad Maxes, sure, and, and you'll get more from your life. It's just, it's there's so many better films and worse films that are better because <laughs> yeah. it just this is unfortunately just a, a bit mundane. Sure. So no, don't don't waste your time. Go watch something else. I'm I'm kind of. Yeah, I'm 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 in the I'm in the same boat. I am. It's not terrible, but I, I I can't I cannot fully recommend Battle Truck because it's just okay. It's a slightly above average, somewhat entertaining Mad Max clone. I feel it's not good enough to recommend, and it's not bad enough to criticize all the flaws. 
The performances ranged from awful to passable, and the story was simple. The characters were underdeveloped, and the action scenes were few and far between. The music score, though, by Kevin Peake was decent and helped hold my interest, and it elevated those chase scenes into something memorable. I also felt that the cinematography was pretty good, probably the best feature of the film, as everything was well lit, especially for the night shots, and the framing of the truck was, was excellent, with some great use of aerial shots. It really helped with those chase sequences uh, amid some fantastic New Zealand landscapes. This film isn't a complete waste of time, as you can do far worse than Battle Truck, but I highly doubt I'll ever come back to this film for a second viewing. <laughs> Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. Inventory and requisition. Loot! Loot!